We're here uh, continuing with our Mark commentary after uh, a few days off. And we were uh, leaving the scene of Jesus eating, reclining, much like sheep lay down to lie down to pasture um, with the sinners as a physician very much in terms of what Ezekiel 34 describes for what I call the Good Shepherd passage in Ezekiel 34. Yahweh says he's going to be the shepherd, but then really it's his servant David. And then after that um, comes uh, a discussion on fasting. And um, we see that John the Baptist still seems to have disciples. So I think this is a historical uh, event, reminiscence anyway, uh, that John's disciples are still active. You would think that according to some of the narratives, if John the Baptist says this is the Lamb of God and tells his disciples go in and follow Jesus in the Gospel of John, where by the way they're still both baptizing at the same time. Uh, and then of course if we see Acts of the Apostles that there are people who only know of John's baptism and have never heard of the Holy Spirit, we see that uh, things are always a little bit more complicated. John the Baptist uh, started uh, an apocalyptic, eschatological, you know, prepare for the judgment of God uh, movement uh, with political overtones for sure, according to Josephus, or at least Herod feared that, and that's why he got him out of the way, not so much due to a dance. And then, of course, we have the, the, the cue a saying, uh, a passage common to Matthew and Luke, not in, in Mark, that John the Baptist in prison sends disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come? So he has doubts about the kind of ministry, especially with sinners and, and eating and all this kind of stuff, meals, uh, that he himself is not characterized by. So here we have a, a saying in Mark 2.18 that... Um, they asked him, why do John the Baptist disciples fast and those of the Pharisees fast? I think they fasted on, on, on Wednesdays and, and, and some other day. Uh, and Jesus uh, then says that this, is, this announcing of the kingdom is tantamount to a banquet or a prelude of a banquet, a joyful uh, meal, which he just had in, in, in a few verses before with sinners, a welcoming people, uh, experiencing the joy of the kingdom as, as a banquet. We have the great saying in Isaiah 25 uh, known as the eschatological banquet. I will prepare a banquet of rich foods, etc. Which, by the way, I have uh, looked into and uh, one can't prove uh, that it refers to eating meat. Uh, oily foods could be, you know, dipped in oil and things like that, but um, I still maintain that in eschatological end of the day's passages, it's uh, a vegetarian diet. Uh, the eating of fish, now that's a problem, so there's always some sort of um, exception. But in any case, this eschatological banquet in Isaiah 25, 6 talks about uh, unveiling. In the, in the Greek, they talk about it, the apocalypse uh, uh, of a mystery, um, you know, um, the revelation of, of, of God to all peoples. So we have um, this image of uh, a banquet and Jesus as the bridegroom which is, of course, an Old Old Testament uh, image of Yahweh, uh, the great, I think the great passage being the one in Hosea, uh, read in the Carmelite nun masses when they're, they're celebrating a saint. I will take you to the desert and seduce you all over again, says Yahweh, and uh, preen you away, pry you away from the Baals and the false gods that you think are the ones that provide for you like a husband, 
I am your real husband. I will provide for you. And uh, he, I actually will even provide the dowry, which consists of six uh, great Hebrew uh, conceptions of righteousness and, and, and mishpah, social justice or right behavior and fidelity. And you will know Yahweh, which is an intimacy term uh, in, in the Old Testament. So uh, Jesus then alludes to this new wine, which is also a sign of the joy of the kingdom. Cana has the turning of ritual purification waters, huge amount, into delicious wine. The end of uh, Amos in chapter 9 talks about lifting up, raising, which is a resurrection verb in, in Hebrew, kum, or uh, even in, in Greek. Uh, I will raise up the fallen sukkah, hut of David. And then, of course, you have the hills distilling wine. So Jesus is talking about this new wine, which old wineskins, uh, it might burst in the old wineskins, etc. So that, um, but, you know, people may still prefer uh, the older wine or something, so... And then you have the episode of the uh, grains being plucked in the Sabbath day, uh, typically considered to be uh, something objectionable to the Pharisees because in their halakha, their legal interpretation of what Torah requires, this is tantamount to harvesting, especially if you rub uh, these grains in your hand, as I think Luke has, and so the Pharisees are, are promoting their program of rigged, rigid uh, adherence to the Torah. And one of the things that the, uh, the Mishnah, the great uh, rabbinic compilation of the second century of Jewish law, which when commented upon becomes the Talmud later, uh, they have this famous line, build a fence around the Torah, meaning uh, for example, and it could work both ways, more lenient or more, more stringent, if the Torah allows 40 lashes as punishment, give 39, lest you go beyond, so that the hedge around the Torah means uh, be more careful than the strict letter of the Torah and give yourself a little buffer or wiggle room so that you don't make a mistake. And so um, they're against uh, doing this kind of thing in the Sabbath. And Jesus um, says that uh, the Sabbath was, was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, and that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Getting back to the Son of Man concept that we've talked about before. This is the 20th session we've had on Mark so far. Um, the Son of Man in John 5 works just like God continues to work even after the Sabbath rest when he finished creation. So God is, is still involved in maintaining the world, but even if, if, even if he had fallen asleep, so to speak, and we're going to revisit that a little bit later with the calming of the storm, but even if God had, has been dormant, and prophetic activity has been dormant for 400 years, since the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And all of a sudden, emerges again with John the Baptist, and then Jesus' actions where God is restoring this, the pre-fall condition. Women with blood flows are being healed, lepers are cleansed, and, and foods are cleansed, according to Mark in chapter 7. What does that do to Leviticus? So... The pre-fall fall Torah is uh, quite a radical concept, but it seems that that's where Jesus is coming from. And uh, that would be extremely radical if we were tr to translate that today. You know, I think some of the stuff Pope Francis says is in line with this radicality. And people think he's, he's nuts, some of some people. Uh, there's a famous, there's an interesting line in 2 Maccabees 5.19 uh, which actually uh, says that the Lord has not chosen the nation because of this place, this holy place, the temple, but has chosen the temple for the nation. So you have um, this kind of parallel 
uh, idea that uh, everything is in service of humanity. You don't follow the law for its own sake. Which brings me to uh, the interesting thing I wanted to comment upon while we have time in these segments where we're trying to keep the 14 or 15 minutes. Jesus men mentions the uh, priest Abiathar so that, um, you know, uh, this is commonly considered to be a mistake uh, in the Gospel of Mark. It's omitted by Matthew uh, and Luke. Uh, Abiathar is the wrong high priest to mention when alluding to the episode in 1 Samuel 21 where uh, David and his men who are fleeing from Saul uh, are hungry and ask to eat the bread of the presence which according to the passage here is not lawful for any but the priests to eat and so uh, there's this dialogue in um, 1 Samuel 21 where uh, the high priest who happens to be Ahimelech um, says, ask if the boys are, are if their bodies are clean or if their equipment is clean uh, because they are in holy war and um, you can't have sex in holy war so this is sort of like a a, a preparation or qualification to uh, eat this bread that really normally is not allowed. But this you have a more moralist call in the incidence of Epicaea leniency where you allow this. But again, if you look at the passage, it's Achimelech, not Abiathar. So the question would be why this so called mistake? Uh, it's time for me to plug, if you will, my website, which you can easily find by typing uh, Emilio Chavez Bible, and you should be getting Bible Explainer, which is the name of the website, Bible-Explainer. And I'm going to bring up here a page from my course notes. When I was a professor of the seminary, I had a lot of course notes that are all freely available. This is Intro to the Bible. Within Intro to the Bible, it's part two. And towards the end of part two, where I get into interpretation uh, issues, um, I discuss uh, in several pages, in some detail, the rival priesthoods in Israel, specifically a northern type uh, priesthood which great scholars like Frank Moore Cross have called Mushite from Moses, with origins in Egypt, very ancient. And this is where the Eli and Shiloh priesthood would come from. And then you have a, a newcomer priesthood, which eventually takes over, which are the Sadokites, the Ben of Zadok. They seem to come from Jerusalem or the Jebusite city that preceded it. Uh, Melchizedek might be related to these people. Melchizedek is the name Zedek, Zedekah, you know, righteousness is related to this Zadok. And, and these guys may have been originally pagan, you know, but they became prominent and eventually, uh, having backed Solomon, become the predominant and only allowed priesthood. And the Abiathar branch is banished to Anitoth, which is where Jeremiah's priesthood people come from, and he's not a Sadokite. So that what you have is our two rival groups, one more older but banished and banned, and whose leader is Abiathar, who's banned. Then you have the rival group, the Zadokites, which really will then be the Sadducees, the great enemies of Jesus. In, 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 in the political, religious situation he finds himself in. And so what you have here, without getting into too much detail, to not spend too much time on it, we keep to our timeline, you have here the mention of an unmentionable, a Beathar, by mistake, quote-unquote. I think the mistakes in the Bible are largely intentional, meaning 
They're not real mistakes. You're saying you're doing it for a purpose. And if you um, if you look at this page 198 of my intro to the Bible notes, it talks about a similar mistake in the opposite sense in the book of Chronicles, where uh, Zadok's historical partner, Abiathar, is unmentionable in the list in 1 Chronicles 24. There, Zadok is placed, paired with Ahimelech, 24 verse 3. And so you have a purging or correction of historical texts in Chronicles to avoid mention of the priest they don't want to mention. And here apparently Jesus, by mistake, very sneaky, is mentioning the unmentionable guy as saying to the Pharisees, there is an alternative opinion, there is another view, and I'm following that view, and we don't accept the imposition of your view. And with that, I'm, I'm going to stop um, uh, and continue next time.